All right, uh, we are live. Welcome to AFAPWA's second action circle in the transforming education cycle. Today is July 25th, 2020. And my name is Abigail Twyman, for those of you who don't know. Um, I am joining you today from the home I share with my husband, Dustin, and our dog, Terror Zeppelin, in the community of Nockety Bay. Uh, our Alaskan oasis is located on northern Prince of Wales Island in southeast Alaska, which is located on Lincoln Ani, which is the land of the Tlingit people. Specifically in what is traditionally um, the home, fishing, hunting, and gathering grounds of the people of Texacan or the Coast Town Tribe. I am honored to be able to share this space with my ancestors and the ancestors of those indigenous to the land I currently inhabit, who fill my soul with a fire that fuels my action. I am dedicated to remembering forward and passing along the immense wisdom to for the benefit of future generations and for the protection of our shared home. I'm also deeply honored to be able to share this space with all of the beautiful humans and change catalysts out there, all of you, who have been inspired and empowered to join our pod. And I am dedicated to use the privileged body I was born into and this platform to catalyze collective action. And I thank you for your commitment to acting in the service of creating peace for yourself, your family, your community, and all inhabitants of Mother Earth. So the first thing that we do um, in action circles is to set our intentions. And so I wanted to, for those of you who are new and this is your first time joining us, I wanna make sure that we're all, um, we all are on the same page. So Action Circles is all about learning how to have more effective conversations around challenging topics, as well as collaborating with others who share our vision, mission, and values. When we come into circle, we assume that all the answers to all our questions are within the circle because we've bought, brought the right group of people together with a collective wealth of knowledge and expertise. And experience. Our guiding theory is that our respective change efforts within our personal and professional lives, as well as our movements and organizations, have had limited impact on the overall trajectory of the data. Therefore, it is incumbent upon us to adjust our approach. By bringing voices together and guiding the conversation in a new yet very old way, we have the potential to develop plans of action which are more likely to get us to the end goal, a truly just, equal, and peaceful world. So really, we're um, coming back to the way it used to be, the way it always should have been. This action circle is the beginning of something we hope will spread. Our goal is to catalyze the spread of action circles across the world in the service of creating peace through collective action. Today, we are continuing our conversation about how we as a collective could come together and transform the educational system. COVID-19 has brought to the forefront the stark reality many of us already knew. Something needs to change to ensure all children are afforded the opportunity to succeed in their lives. The path toward this ideal comes through a just and equitable system, which is not our current reality. The intended outcomes for Action Circles is to end each cycle with a clear picture of the next right actions, both as a collective and as individuals. Together we will take action, together we will transform education, and together we will create peace. Thank you all for being here today to share your wisdom with the circle. Before we, before we begin the conversation, it's important to establish uh, the agreements that will guide us and protect us within the circle. We have six agreements that serve as the starting point for action circles, and they belong to the circle. They are, they are reviewed at the beginning of every action circle, and any member at any time can propose additions or modifications. Our first agreement is that while every action circle will be recorded um, and made public, the story shared within the circle should only be shared in a way that protects, uplifts, inspires, and empowers others. The second agreement is that we will listen to each other with curiosity and compassion, withholding all judgment. The third agreement is that we ask for what we need and offer what we can. The fourth agreement is that from time to time we will pause to regather our thoughts or, or focus in um, a silent reflection. The fifth agreement is that from the chat function, 
is reserved for contributions from those who choose typing as their um, primary mode of communication or the preferred, preferred mode. And for gems, which are any quotes that are harvested by the scribes of the group, which are all of you. So if you hear something that somebody says that's, that sparks something in you and you want to kind of capture that gem, we will harvest those by um, quoting, them in the, quoting them in the chat box for um, future use. Um, and then our sixth, uh, our sixth agreement is that whenever, whenever possible, we use primarily sound verbal behavior, which is deliberate and measured speech when sharing our perspectives within the circle. So we've had a, we have had one person join us. So I'm going to, Natasha, I'm going to make you number 11 in our circle. Um, and we're going to follow the um, number order with our sharing. So our, for our first round of the circle, um, we're going to, is to establish our agreements and to check in. So I will give everybody an opportunity. We're gonna make a round around the circle and share your name with the group. Um, if you have a land, land acknowledgement that you are, would like to provide, please provide that. Um, and then today, oh, your, ch your check-in, this is a, a, a check-in activity that I learned during a training this summer, um, is an emotionary. So if you think of two words, two kind of emotional words, and create one word out of them to kind of reflect how you're feeling. So I will go ahead and start to model what this might look like. Um, and, uh, and then we'll go, we'll pass the talking piece around the circle. So as I said, my name is Abigail Twyman and I currently reside on the un unceded territory of the Lincoln Ani, the, the um, Clinket people um, who are indigenous to this land um, and still live and thrive in this community and um, I uplift them always. My emotionary word is I'm feeling, I'm going to take the two words, um, inspired and tired and make the word how I'm feeling today. I'm feeling inspired. <laughs> So now I'm going to pass it on to our next person, which is Alex. Let's see. I'm Alex. I'm in Madison, Wisconsin, which uh, is also the uh, the original residence of the Ho Chunk people, and I am feeling detrunctious. I am determined and anxious. All right. <laughs> Hi, my name is Amy McDonald, and I live just down the road from Abbey um, on Prince of Wales Island as well. So um, I guess today I was trying to, I had to write them down and figure out how to put my two words together. I guess I'm feeling intrigued and motivated. So maybe introverted might be my word today. Thanks. Hi everyone, um, I'm Chris. Um, right now I'm in Southwest Virginia um, and I don't know enough about the land to make an acknowledgement um, yet, let me say. Um, and I'm feeling critical and jittery. I just had like some matcha, which I don't usually do. Um, and there's children that I'm gonna be taking care of right after this, so. Um, so, and so critical and jittery, jittical, let's say. Yeah. Hi, I'm Deepinder. Uh, originally from India, so I do uh, honor the land I was born in and the culture I was raised. And I live in New Jersey, 25 years. Uh, I lot going on in our country. I still I'm very proud to be American. Uh, very proud as a woman, as a brown person, as a minority. What America gave me, I don't think so any other country would have given me. 
I'm the only brown behavior analyst in my company. Um, and I'm the only one above the age of 40. Uh, I will be 50 this year and I, I'm glad to be alive and I say my age out loud because I am on this earth and I have this opportunity to be here. Um, so I'm sorry, I don't know the, all the land it belonged to, which tribes of native Indians, I'm going to research into it. It gave me something to look into it, you know? And the word that comes to my mind is uh, moang, so more for motivated. And I was angry with my husband in the morning. So, yeah, so it is more ang. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for listening to me. Is it uh, five now? Um, hello, I'm John Kelling. Um, I'm from Madison, Wisconsin. Um, I've been thinking this whole time about a word to borrow from a couple others, I would say determined and critical, maybe. Um, de de uh, determined, crit determined, cool. <laughs> That's really hard. Good luck to everyone else. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Carrie. I live in Lake Ronkonkoma, New York. And so we had uh, 13 tribes on Long Island, um, but in this particular area, it was the Setauket's, the Nisiquags, the Secatogs, and the Unkachogs. And I had to look that up because I can never remember all of the, all of the tribes that were here. Um, I am feeling very tired today, but also motivated. So um, my word is, Tyrovated. <laughs> so we're gonna go with that. But it's good to see you all again today. Here we are. You're seven now. Locking a lot. It's my turn. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Oh, oh well, so I guess my my word will be uh curulent. That's uh, silent and curious. Curulent, si curious and silent. Um so I'm in Federal Way, Washington, which is just south of Seattle. Um, <clears throat> guess I'm not sure. Uh, Chief Seattle was from what group of Indians? I'm not sure. Native Americans. Um, my son lives up in uh, Bellingham, where the Lemmy Indians are. Um, I grew up in Moscow, Idaho, and uh, we have the Coeur d'Alene Indians north of us, and uh, I've forgotten the ones, the group in Lewiston and era, that area, which roamed uh, all throughout North uh, Idaho. Um, when I was a Boy Scout, and I went on a national jamboree. Uh, <clears throat> the train started in Spokane. Well, it started in Seattle, and we picked them up. At, uh, uh, our group picked them up in Spokane. We went over to uh, Montana, and the train stopped. We got off the train and had a big ceremony by the Blackfoot uh, tribe. And for some reason or another, I was one of three was chosen to receive uh, honorary membership in Blackfoot tribe. And at the time I was entitled, I was titled as chief, uh, chief little chief. <laughs> that's, that's my story. <laughs> Hello, 
<clears throat> Thank you. Mary, it's you. Um, my name is Mary Wong. I am in Madison and I know Alex. Uh, he invited me to join you and I thank you for that, Alex. Um, Madison, as Alex pointed out, is the uh, mostly Ho-Chunk, but I grew up farther north in Wausau and there were a lot of Menominee Indians in my community that I got to know over the years. But honestly, we didn't talk much in those days about um, who, what that meant, you know, for them or for us. Um, my word is hope innovative because um, I made this switch to online teaching in March. I'm doing a lot of reconstruction of curricula because I teach at the University of Wisconsin as a English as a second language teacher. And I'm, I'm excited by the ability to collaborate with my students in a way I haven't had to do before because, you know, I was the expert and they were the students and we always encourage collaboration, but I, I feel really hopeful about the direction that online teaching is going, at least in my little corner of the world. I, right now I'm teaching um, people who are in India, the Ukraine, and Mexico none of them here except me and it's going really well and i'm really loving it so that's why i'm feeling like i'm being innovative but also hopeful so hope innovative hello my name is maximus pepperkamp uh, i live in chico in north california uh, I'm a self-taught behaviorist and I teach uh, psychology at Butte College. Um, here in Chico is uh, an area where the Maidu tribe lives. Actually, when I was going to Butte College, uh, where I'm also, where I graduated, um, I was also a tutor for Maidu kids at Moortown Rancheria. And um, yeah, um, I love being in this group. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm excited and I'm open, so I'm ex open. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Sherry Becker, and um, I also live just down the road from Abigail and Amy. And um, most I know so far about our community on our Prince of Wales Island is um, the Tlingit Haida group and the history of that group um, I need to learn a little bit more about. The, the word I am thinking for myself is either optivated or motiv motivistic. <laughs> and, um, and that's just... I'm very optimistic, optimistic about the direction that our school district is going um, in developing their back to school plan. And I'm very motivated by all of the, the support and the, um, just the dedication of our staff throughout our district and um, very motivated by them and their participation in the development of the plan um to continue on and uh, make it the best year for our students as possible hello hi right here thank you for the invitation my name is atasha i'm from chicago illinois and i got the opportunity to i guess google who which native tribe <laughs> lives in Chicago and I, I I am reading the list of names Polly I'm sorry Polly Wanty um I want a citizen of Polly Wadi I, I do apologize if someone can help me with the pronunciation for these words um well I 
I not I am a student, uh, a ABA student right now, and I'm just interested in learning more and growing in the field of ABA. And uh, thank you again. Oh, I'm sorry, my word is my feeling of today. I'm feeling um, uh, mixed feelings, um, uh, nervous, hopeful, and motivated. So um, nervous abated, if that's, uh, but yeah, again, thank you for welcoming to your group. Harry, you're number 12. You're our final group member. <coughs> I'm number 12, you said? <coughs> yep. OK. Uh, hi, I'm Harry. Uh, sorry I'm squirming so much. I'm having a lot of neck and back pain. I know it looks really awkward. I kind of um, woke up on the wrong side of the bed, it seems. Um, <coughs> uh, and uh, I live in Ohio. Uh, the people who lived in here before Europeans settled were the Iroquois and Algonquin. I had the chance to Google that while I was waiting. Um, <clears throat> two emotiony words I'm feeling. Uh, I guess uh, cynical, shitty and cynical. And then the other one is uh, optimistic, cautiously optimistic, I guess. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you all for introducing yourselves to the um, to the group um, and sharing your emotional words. So, oh. um, you know, I, it's just I love I love the that um, that check in activity because it honors the two things where it's like you can feel really, you know, you can feel two things or, you know, multiple things at once and being able to, you know, talk about that and identify that um, can help us, you know, help us honor who we are as humans because we, we're not always, you know, we're not always one thing. <clears throat> All right. So, um, so when coming into, when coming into circle, typically, if we were in person. Um, we, there would generally be one or more items placed at the center of the circle as a focal point. And um, the power of the circle is that opposed to common approaches to difficult conversations, which often turn into power struggles, here um, in, in the action circles, we speak from the rim of the circle into the center which indicates to us that all of our voices have equal power and because we all have something important to contribute to the greater to the greater good. Um, our centerpiece today is I'm an amateur photographer so I'm sharing my some of my pictures here. Um, so our um, our centerpiece for today is the poppy flower in its budding stage. And um, this beautiful flower is now bloomed and I, I got the pleasure of taking the, a picture of it yesterday and it's gorgeous. Um, but today I chose the budding stage of the poppy flower um, because inside of this beautiful little um, pod here is something that is amazingly beautiful. But until the flower, until it blooms, we can only imagine and envision what's inside. Um, and so today, this picture made me think of kind of the current place we are at in this conversation. So last week, we had the introductory, introductory conversation where we got out all of our questions. What are, what, why are we here? Why are we having this conversation? And what, what questions could we answer or do we need to answer as a group? Um, and today we come into this, into this circle, into the second gathering of the, um, the transforming education cycle, where we're going to be focusing on envisioning what could be possible, what could we do. So um, today, 
we have the honor of welcoming um, one of our circle members, Depender, to guide us through our opening meditation. Um, so we can all come into this space and prepare to engage in a deep and meaningful conversation. So I will mute myself and pass it to you, Depender. Thank you, Abby. Uh, it will be like eight to 10 minutes. We are going to do a mindful meditation focused on breath and bodily sensations. Uh, it, and it doesn't matter if you have any experience with it earlier or not. It's just mindful meditation with a breath. We all have a breath with us anyway. It is not something which you don't know what it is because it's your breath, right? Yeah. Uh, so we'll start uh, without talking anymore. Right. Find your comfortable position. Yeah. So your body is relaxed but alert. Your eyes could be open or closed as you prefer. Could be half closed, kind of, so that they're gently uh, not focusing on the things in your environment, rather helping you look inside. I'm going to put a timer on so that I can do the meditation with you. Okay. So our shoulder blades are rolled back. Our spine is straight. Face is relaxed. Jaw is relaxed. Our eyes are gently closed or half the way closed. Are open. Just let your body settle in. And we are going to bring our attention right under our nose. So our attention is on an area under our nose, on top of our upper lip. We're just watching as naturally the breath enters our body and then leaves, and then enters and then leaves. So our awareness is right by our nose, at the entrance of our nose. We are just watching when the breath enters and then it leaves. That's it. And the mind will wander away. Remember, it's the nature of the mind to wander away. It's all right, it wandered away. When you realize, it has wandered away. You just gently bring it back to watching your breath. Some breaths might be shorter and some might be longer. Some might be strong, 
in some might we weep. We are not judging our breaths. We are just observing it like the observer. You might feel the breath is stronger in one nostril than the other. Or you might feel when the breath enters the body, it's cooler. When it leaves the body, it's warmer. You can just label it. Don't analyze it. Just label it. your mind wanders away, I'm sure it does. It's all right. When you realize it has wandered away, gently bring it back to the focus of the meditation, watching our breath under our nose. Watching our breath under our nose. If 
We are the observer of our breath. Just observing as it enters the body and leaves the body. Gently, when you are ready, wiggle your toes, wiggle your fingers, softly open your eyes up. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. Anyone has any quick question regarding it? Feel free to put it in the chat box or if Abby has a minute, they can ask me right now. Okay, so that Thank was you. our mindful meditation with breath awareness. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. That was wonderful. Thank you, Dependent. No problem, my pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, of course. So as we're as we're kind of now fully in the circle, we've kind of you know centered ourselves. We're feeling. I know. I know that I personally am feeling very relaxed and very centered. And this is a perfect place to really kind of come into our conversation because if our minds and our thoughts are focused on things that are happening outside of the circle, it's difficult to be fully engaged within the circle. That's why starting our circles with something with a center and opening activity is really important. So now I'd like you to imagine, if you will, that we, the 12 of us in this circle, are. Um, or 13, 13 of us, sorry, uh, apparently can't count. Um, so the 13 of us in this circle um, are among 10,000 people who were transported to a remote island on which all of the basic resources are available. So we have building materials, utilities, homes, so our basic you know, resources and infrastructures are here, but we have been charged with responsibility of designing the most amazing educational system that meets everybody's needs. Okay. And today, during this space, we're going to focus on our K-12 schools, but we know that education is a lifelong process, right? We have the birth to three um, group of children, which are very important, but have a different set of needs. And our, you know, our K-6 schools and uh, seven through 12, this is the group that we're gonna, that I'd like to focus us on today. And the universities are very important and, um, you know, have, you know, have a need to find ways to better need, meet the needs of everybody. But today again, we're gonna focus on our K-12. So for, I would like you to grab your piece of paper and your writing utensil that you brought into the circle. And for the next um, couple minutes, I just want you to, start just write down draw something that your is your idea of what the perfect school would need or could um so what what would it have what would the perfect school have and i'm going to give us a few minutes just to kind of think about this jot some ideas down about what the perfect school would have and then we're going to do a circle activity um, kind of with those ideas. So be thinking about how you could put your idea of like that, you know, the one perfect thing that your that you that your school needs into a short phrase. Okay. So I'm going to give us three minutes to reflect and think about what the perfect school would have what you what you would
Okay, so finish up your final thoughts while I'm explaining kind of what we're going to do with the next activity. So the next activity is one that, again, I was, I was taught this summer during a, um, a training institute uh, done by IFSEL, which is the Institute for Social Emotional Learning, um, that I felt was really powerful. It was a really good way to just get our, you know, get our thoughts, um, get our thoughts on paper and kind of quick fire round. And then also to kind of engage in a different type of behavior that we might not do often, which is to lift up and add to the thoughts of others. And so um, this activity is called Yes, Because, And. And so I am going to start by offering up a suggestion to the circle in the form of a question. So I'm going to say, could our school have blank? Okay, and I'm just going to say what I, what I think our school should have, and I'm not going to give any reasons. And then the next person is going to emphatically say, and the rest of you on mute can also say, yes, like that is the most amazing idea, yes. And then we're going to say, because, and then you're going to say, because, and then you, the next person is giving the rationale for the suggestion of the other, per, the previous person. And then they're going to make a suggestion. Okay, so it's gonna, I'm gonna model both, both pieces of it so you can see. So I'm gonna say, could our school have um, a covered playground? I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go very simple, but could our, could our school have a covered playground? And then the next person would say, yes, because it rains a lot in Southeast Alaska. So of course we need a covered playground. And then the next person would, and then you would say, and could our school have blank? And then the next person will go. So hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so I will get us started. And then who is number two? Number two is Amy. Oh no, sorry, number one would be the next, Alex. Sorry, Alex, you're, you're after me. So could our school have a real-time data collection system? Yes, because it's important that we know what's going on, well, in real time. Otherwise, we won't be able to figure out how each thing that happens affects things. And could our school have um, more teachers and mentors to give more personalized feedback to smaller groups of students? Yes, because we know research says that one of the best ways to meet the needs of kids is to have one adult to at least every five students in a school. Could our school have relationships before academics, adult student relationships before academics? Yes, because uh, academics aren't necessarily the most important thing nor the thing that we internally prize. Um, could our school have teachers of almost any age? Yes, we, we do need teachers of any age. I see your point. Uh, and could our schools have a meditation room in the school which is not like a punishment area not that where the teacher sends it hey you are acting out go to the meditation room which is more like you just want to be left alone and the student has a right to raise a hand i need just a little quiet time yes i think they could have that um I think uh, being a parent of a special needs student, um, I recognize the need for definitely taking a different pace. Everybody take everybody needs to take a different pace through their day, through learning, through relationships, and everything. And um, having a just a safe comfort, a safe zone, something that, a place that's comfortable. Um, that allows a uh, student to reflect where they may not be able to at home because again, or not again, but 
a school is a sort of a second home for a lot of people. Um, and maybe the only area that they can do something like that. Um, and could our schools have equality? Yes, because it comes down to basic human rights. We all deserve to have our educational needs met. Could our school have child and parent preference and learning modalities versus a one um, before a one size fits all approach to learning? Um, I'm not entirely sure what you mean by that. Uh, can you explain what that is? Yes. So, um, right now when you go into a classroom, the teacher basically, te most teachers, not all teachers, um, they teach based on what's in, um, the textbook based on standards given to them by a state agency and um, there's very little individualization or students choosing, you know, to do um, hands-on projects versus, um, you know, think of like the different ways that people learn, either visual, auditory, et cetera. Um, you know, Montessori approach versus what we typically see in an elementary school. That's where I was going with it. Preference for learn. Awesome. Thank you, Gary. Malcolm, you're, you're next in, in line. So give me a cue here. So the so um, so the your your role your step is to say yes to Carrie's to Carrie's suggestion. Yes, we could have that um, because so you're kind of giving the rationale for her answer, and then you're okay. offering up what we could have, what you think we could have. We should. <clears throat> yeah. So the contributions of precision teaching as learning channels, not, not modes or um, what's the styles, that's the conventional thing, but rather um, learning channels. And Ogden um, carried the learning channels into more of learning streams. And um, so a stream can have channels and you, the initiation of the, say, the stimulus can be a number of things, uh, free thought, um, and then uh, the number of things of, that was mentioned in terms of visual or hearing or, uh, so Larry Cotton and uh, Elizabeth came up with learning channel matrix. And up the left column, they had all the sensory, and the bottom column, had, or the bottom of the, the, I guess it'd be the x-axis, would have uh, output. Um, Ogden didn't care for input and output. Uh, he, he saw it more of a stream, a more of a natural thing rather than a mechanistic situation. And so that's why he came up with um, learning, learning streams. And that we shouldn't uh, necessarily have a style of learning, but all of our um, all of our functions should be um, at at a high um, uh, at a high frequency of level of usage. Um, and I think that's a contribution for that precision teaching has for classrooms, uh, rather than to have. Um, 
a learning style and the rest of it is not your style. It's, we should, as human beings, have all of our, um, all of our, uh, <laughs> our learning streams and channels uh, functioning at uh, useful uh, levels. Okay. Maximus, our number eight, uh, our number eight um, left the circle. So you're next, Maximus. Okay, so I didn't get uh, Malcolm. Uh, you said should should you did not make a suggestion in that should our school have such and such? Yeah. Did you still so, say that? Yeah. Can I, Malcolm? Can I can I rephrase that? Because I, I I was picking up what you were throwing down. Um, so I think the, the suggestion was, could our, you know, could our schools have, you know, focus on um, precision teaching and learning streams as opposed to, you know, you know, styles of learning? Is that? Yes, of course. <laughs> and um, it would be very good to have that and to, um, give each person um, access to learning in this way. Um, and I would also like to um, suggest, um, could our school for those students who are able to speak and to listen, um, could these students um, be together in a room which is specially dedicated to only speaking and listening? And so we are only in this room to explore speaking and listening. Which I think, sorry, and I think we skipped number 10 because Sherry left, sorry. Oh, sorry, I, I just wanted to add that, that um, speaking and listening are the most important behaviors which have so much of an effect on all our other behaviors. And so I would like to have a special place to um, pay attention to these two behaviors. Thank you. And yes, num thank you, Maximus. And yes, 10 did um, leave the circle. So Natasha, you are next. Okay, um, I'm unclear of the um, question from the other participant. So let me just, position teaching, is that what you're referring to? Uh, yeah, so I know, I know this gets, it gets a little bit confusing. Um, so Maximus suggested that we have, our school have a room um, dedicated only to the exploration of uh, speaking and listening. So those two particular skills. And so then your mm. kind of on your turn, you would um, say yes, emphatically, like you agree that that's a great idea, give the rationale why you think it's a good idea, and then offer up your suggestion. Um, I may say maybe. If it's just um, on the basis of the re uh, this is maybe because I'm un kind of unclear, but I am assuming that they may not be it maybe have questions and we don't and if it's structured in a way that they could, um, maybe there's more directions or there's more um, uh, yes, we'll move on. So, um, but uh, one thing, I guess for my part, um, could our school have, or can each student have their own personal computer provided by the school? I'm sorry, what did you say? I couldn't hear you. 
Could During our what? Could our school have? Can each student in our school have their own personal computer provided by the school or by the district? Ah, uh, gotcha. Oh, by the way, am I number twelve or number thirteen? I forgot. You're number twelve. I changed your your name. Um, so it has your number right in front of it. Gotcha. Thank you. I appreciate it. So yeah, yes. Uh, comp personal computers for all the students would be amazing because they're so they're so expensive and so many people can't afford them and they're basically like required for like functioning society now. Um, um, I would also recommend uh, not only do we focus on how our students in our school are learning, but we also want to think about what they're learning because like a lot of schools end up being like not teaching skills and knowledge that are actually useful for the students to know. You know, they end up like shoving random useless trivia down their throats. And I think it would, and I feel like it would be better if we were to actually like have teachers who know how to teach, you know, and have them like teaching knowledge and skills that are useful for the students for their own competence in life, as well as for their, as well as to help them be able to competently participate and contribute to institutions in our society. So like basically make the curriculum actually relevant to what the student needs and what society needs from the students, I guess. Yes, I agree. And that was a perfect segue. It's almost like we planned this, but we didn't. <laughs> so yes, <laughs> we can have, um, we can have meaningful curriculum that is actually you know meeting the needs of the students and and helping them learn what they need as individuals to be the most successful and improve their own quality of life so um so that was so i really like this activity as something you know if you were going to be you know hosting your own action circle or um hosting a meeting where these types of conversations have um you know, are there's something there's something powerful about building up somebody else's idea and then adding on to it um, when it comes to collaborative collaboration um, on important um, topics like this, where we all have something, we all have different perspectives and values and things that we care about the most. And this is kind of you know the power of bringing all of these ideas together. So now we're going to move into um, our um, sharing phase of action circles where we're going to start exploring some of the questions that we came up with during our first gathering. And so the first, um, we have, let's see, we have nine, 10, 11. We've got 11 people in this circle and we've got about 45 minutes left of our scheduled time. And so for your responses to these answers, let's try to keep them kind of contained to, you know, like one, one minute. Um, and so we have the ability to get through our rounds of, our rounds of questions um, to, uh, to bring, um, to, to bring this information forward and really thinking about what we could do. So the first question, there, there's two questions that you can kind of consider in your response and then kind of provide, um, kind of share your contribution. So the two questions are, what are the fundamental goals of structured education and how, we can, how can we support learners in those goals? And then who decides what specifically people learn? So what are the subjects the, and what's most important? So what are the fundamental goals of education and who decides what we're teaching? So again, I kind of want you to think about, um, think about those two questions and how you would respond to them. I'll give you just a minute to reflect and then I will begin our circle or this round a uh, question are, are we trying to figure are we trying to identify who currently decides uh what gets taught or are we trying to identify who should decide what gets taught yeah that same question same 
Yeah, that's a good question. Let's focus on who, who we think should be making the decisions. So what do we believe are the fundamental goals? So what do you believe are the fundamental goals of structured education? And who do you believe should be making the decisions? So thank you for that clarification, Harry. Okay, so I'll go ahead and get us started. I believe that the fundamental goal of um, education is to ensure that all humans have the fluency in the basic foundational skills of learning and living um, in order to be most successful in their context, in their environment. Um, and I think that who should be making the curricular decisions are um, the communities and the families who are within that community to identify kind of what are the most important things to be teaching for the people who live um, in, that, in that area. And I'm passing it to Alex. Let's see, I think that uh, the structured education would be to empower people to solve problems individually and collectively, and who decides, I think that the community should decide the framework for what sorts of things should be learned, but as far as the specifics go, I think it would help to, to give students a bit of freedom to decide what kinds of things within those topics they learn. Should I go now? Okay, um, so I think ideally the goal of um, education is to have students determine what the best version of themselves and their community is, and then to develop the skills to achieve those two things, a best version of themselves and the best version of their community. And kind of in line with that, uh, I think that students and teachers should co-design what they learn. So they should co-design the curriculum um, to determine what should be learned. And that kind of avoids the problems of brainwashing or irrelevant information if the students are deciding what they need to learn. So. <clears throat> I think I'm next. Man, this is a tough question um, to try to come up with something unique. I'm just like, just made this up like 15 seconds ago. I think uh, um, considering the state of the world right now and the challenges and struggles we all have just communicating with each other and accessing and delivering information, um, I think you could really f point to the fundamentals of our education system, you know, as, as kind of bringing about some of the challenges we face today. And I, I don't think we can foresee all the consequences of a fund of uh, any particular education system. So maybe having a dynamical, um, in, you know, the fundamentals be sort of dynamical based on just the state of things and maybe who decides who teaches. You know, I think if, if you have uh, the fundamental structure be dynamical, maybe any previous generation would have something unique to bring to the table in educating anybody. Okay. 
So, Abby, we were thinking along the same lines. Um, but I also, my vision is to avoid mistakes from the past. We have to learn history in order to make better choices for the future. Um, but we also need to learn skills to be successful in our environments. And who should be making these decisions? Again, Abby, I went straight to families and communities, like you were saying. Um, it really needs to be on a local level because what's going to help our kids become successful adults in the communities and with, with which they live. In which Are we missing someone? No, nope, Malcolm, you're you're welcome to go ahead when you're ready. Okay, okay, I didn't know whether everyone had finished or not. Or okay, uh, so yeah, I think we we need an education that will allow everyone to function within their environment and be creative as to whom should be the. Uh, who should be involved with um, decision of uh, for uh, educating? Everyone has talked about the local people having um, uh, um, deciding factors of what should be taught, and that's that's for sure. Uh, but that gets into the uh, local community, the state, and the and the federal government issues, uh, and. One of the problems with uh, the local uh, the local uh, decision makers uh, can be too narrow and can be abusive, and that's when state and federal uh, requirements have to be considered and maybe uh, structured. Uh, and so we'll begin. We can debate those different levels and certainly i think all three should be involved with with uh, the decision making of what education should be uh local decision makers can be uh too as i said too narrow and uh restrictive and um and uh, i forgot what word i want but um can abuse certain groups um, by narrowly by limiting education, uh, and when the, they're not then capable of going elsewhere, <laughs> uh, they're not capable of moving about. Um, uh, also, with the mobility of, uh, uh, of our population. Uh, if you are educated in one place, uh, that may be the only place you can be, but uh, the needs for all of us to contribute, uh, we be need to be mobile with our education as well to be able to go anywhere. Um, so anyway, I guess that's uh, poorly said, but uh, all levels of uh, government probably have to be considered in expectations in our in, in our environments not just local but on a wider scale then okay this is this is my idea um i will suggest something much more radical 
along the lines of B.F. Skinner. First and foremost, given the state of the world and given the general ignorance about behaviorism, we need to teach behaviorism. And there needs to be an enormous, strict, knowledgeable, skillful, deliberate focus on the teaching of behavioral science and so that we all come aboard with the notion that there's no behavioral causing self, that there are no thoughts, there's no mind. We need to be brave and stand up for our natural science of human behavior and really let people know that what we have believed isn't true and we need to introduce determinism also in a new way. We need to understand determinism in terms of how we affect each other and how we are affected by each other. And so in learning about the science of human behavior, we are going to um, move beyond cultural, um, you could say superstition that has been maintained and that hasn't been even touched, hasn't even been put on the table as something that we need to discuss and need to get rid of. Because the time is ticking and we need to move forward. We know what we know based upon behavioral science. And it is almost as if we're saying, no, the earth is flat. Well, no, it is not flat. The earth is round and it is not the center of the universe. We cannot accept these kind of ideas. And so the people who teach this, the people who are going to, yeah, who are going to um, teach the fundamentals of, 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 of teaching of behaviorism, they have to be people who are not into this philosophical diversity, which sort of waters down behaviorism. And um, to me, that is really the quintessential issue of our time. We need to come aboard with behavioral science. The world needs to accept that there is such a thing as behavioral science. It's a science like biology, physics, um yeah chemistry and that firm insistence on behavioral science is going to uh, make the behavioral improvements that we would like to see whether it is to decrease undesirable behavior or increase desirable behavior pro-social behavior behavior that will benefit our community but this is not a uh, up for grabs who feels like it. It is not something that is going to come about as long as we keep uh, fiddling along with issues that everybody may have their say, no, there's no such thing. There, there cannot be that way anymore because we need to insist on behavioral science. And unless we are adhering to behavioral science, and unless we also, and this is also another aspect of this, why this hasn't happened, unless we change the way in which we talk so that this can come about, because it hasn't come about, it couldn't come about, because we haven't really talked about our way of talking, which has prevented that. So we need to address the way of talking, which will make it possible. Yeah, We're, we have been talking about epistemological barriers and, and, and cultural superstition and so forth, and mysticism and all that kind of stuff, but it was never, those, those were never the reasons that we were prevented from learning about behaviorism. What has prevented behaviorism is that we haven't had the way of communicating which would teach behaviorism and which would make it understood and which would really elevate mankind into, you could say, a, a state of being which would, um, yeah, which would just really transform uh, life as we know it because that is really the potential of behavioral science, which hasn't been utilized at all. 
Can I ask a clarifying question? When sure. you say when you say behaviorism, you mean like the Skinnerian technique, and also yeah. like and the learning theory that accompanies that, which is Absolutely. like stimulus natural, and response kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. Everything that that Skinner has said, of course, uh, primarily also verbal behavior. Yeah, because we are talking about our verbal behavior, speaking and listening, um, and, but of course also writing and reading. But nonetheless, um, everything along Skinner's line, but also I would very much emphasize the importance of behaviorology. Yeah, behaviorology, which is um, never really gotten any foothold. But there's a reason for that, of course, because we haven't addressed the way we talk. And so, but um, the, the science of human behavior is a fact. We do not need to reinvent the wheel. Yeah, all the empirical data is there. And, and uh, it is ridiculous that we haven't addressed the elephant in the room, which is how we talk with each other. And that's where our attention needs to be to move things forward and in the dissemination of what we know. Yeah, not only behavioral science, but also the other sciences. Yeah, there's a big discrepancy between what we know and what we culturally believe, and that needs to be addressed. And it can only be addressed with a proper way of talking. Without the way of talking, we are not going to address our issues. We're not going to solve our problems. We're going to have all sorts of descriptions of problems which do not lead us anywhere and which basically get us more and more divided into the camps that we are already in and where we are already endlessly struggling with each other. We need to come together in this conversation where we can really agree that this is what we need to do to overcome these problems that we're having. And there is such a possibility. I, I firmly believe in that. I, I firmly believe that we can achieve that. And so education is the key in this issue and education should also in this case uh, yeah, be very, very strongly directed towards teaching behaviorism. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Maximus. Hi. Natasha? Hi. Um, so before I was just listening to you guys, and thank you for sharing. I, for, for me, if I can even ask or ask you this question, or even for, um, for my answer, I believe, or at least I more believe, <laughs> um, based on my learned history, I like to say that it's important for to know to know what barriers or variables in the child's environment that that may that hinders the ability to to learn if it's like food or or, or even their their own environment. Because at the end of the day, uh, we ha that may affect the teacher's ability to do, uh, like not only the teacher's ability to teach, but also the students to learn. So it's important for to, to see what, again, what variables, variables in the environment that hinders the individual's ability to, to overcome, um, ability to achieve greatness. And once we're able to, uh, to, uh, to understand and to identify these variables, then we could address them and, and even, to, and then before, before we could even teach some of these children, because at the end of the day, you know, um, some of them may, may not uh, may have, have uh, are deprived of some type of um, form of food or attention so I think that and sometimes that lead to problem behaviors itself so that's where I um, want to say to that um, and I guess once that has been you know um, at least addressed and then then I think the real question is and then we could start um, with these goals in mind and then um, one of the goals it, I want to say is to create a learning environment that have that has um that is have a lot of uh reinforcement like that create an environment that has have contingencies for people to learn and um 
for them to engage in these uh, on task behaviors and, and create a and design with that in mind and like I guess in the, like a create like using the ABA principle of, principle of uh, ABA to definitely um the center vocal the center vocal point. Um, thank you. Oh, is it turn? Sorry, I forgot. Uh, is there? A, is it my turn? Yep. Is it? Is it my? God, just make sure. I forgot there were other people who like had left the meeting earlier. So, um, <clears throat> seems to me like the fundamental goals of structured education. Uh, the version I think the the goal is to impart knowledge and skills uh, that people find helpful. Uh, either for themselves or for others or for their communities or for society. And then uh, uh, a lot of other people made a lot of good points that I feel like I don't need repeating. Uh, like what Abigail and Alex said, as well as what John said. Um, as for who should decide, uh, and also uh, on, it depends on the subject as well as on the student's goals and also on the needs of other people and the needs of communities or of society. So I feel like it's the sort of thing that would like be vary with the situation somewhat and what sorts of problems need solving. So, you know, just in this, what sort of services or goods that need producing, you know, that sort of thing, you know, what sort of needs there are, you know, so. Perfect, thank you. All right. Okay. So, um, if you see that I, I kind of, I was trying to paraphrase and summarize and pull out some, um, those gems and nuggets of wisdom. So hopefully I reflected your, um, contributions in a way that kind of matches your intention, but please feel free to correct if not. Um, so for the, for the final round, um, around the circle as we're getting ready to kind of close out here. There's a lot, you know, you all have so much kind of knowledge and expertise and experience to share with those in your environment who are you know, having the same concerns, making these decisions, they're in, they're kind of in this like planning and preparation mode and getting ready for the school year. And you're all here for a reason. You, know, you, you are a, a special, you know, you're unique in your um, skills and abilities and your passion for wanting to affect change in the world. And and so kind of as we're getting ready to go out into the week and, you know, kind of for the rest of the weekend, hopefully you all are having an opportunity to rest and recharge. Um, and then as you're getting, as you're thinking about next week and what, you know, what's going on in your world and what you could possibly do to help support those who are, if you're not the one that isn't responsible for making decisions, you might be involved in a group of people who is responsible for making decisions, or you might have people in your life who, who you could kind of provide some support to. So for a final round, what I would like to, um, you to think about and to um, think about contributing is what could you do? What could you do to support the people in your community and your family who are in charge of teaching the learners? Um, so they're able to do their jobs well. Um, and then who might you invite to circle next time to continue this conversation and start to kind of move into that next phase of this process where we're creating some more specific actionable items. Um, so kind of that 
hoped for outcome of this action circle cycle is to, you know, inspire you all to go out into your own communities and, you know, be, um, share all of your greatness. But then also, kind of what, what could we do to further support and disseminate as a collective through white papers, through um, memes, through, um, you know, sharing information with providing some, you know, putting together some guiding documents um, to share what we know with the world. And as, you know, um, Maximus pointed out, we are not always great about communicating in a way, communicating our message in a way that um, has the intended impact that we are going for. So we all have, you know, gone into situations where we have really good intentions. We want things to change. We want things to be better. We have a vision, but we don't, we are not always necessarily approaching that change process in the most effective way. I'm just being kind of thinking about what is, you know, what is something actionable that you could do to support your people and who could you invite to kind of come into this conversation next week when we start to kind of nail down what are those things, like specific things we could do? And it doesn't have to be big. We're not, you know, the world will not be changed overnight, but every little step that we take in the right direction is, um, is a good, is a good move. Um, so one thing that I am going to do this week because I am a special education teacher and I'm getting ready to go into the school year, um, but I'm not the one responsible for making all of the decisions. What I am going to do to support the people in my community who are responsible for making these decisions is to um, review the guiding documents and provide my feedback to the team regarding what, you know, what my perspective is. And so, and I will be, I did invite some people from my, from my district who were here today. Um, and I will continue to engage the um, leaders in my district to engage them in these conversations. And I pass to Alex. Uh, let's see, what can, hmm, I didn't have any time to, to think about this one here. Um, let's see, so what can I do to, to support people right now with transforming education? Well, let's see, I can help people with getting the, the basic paradigms, because right now the education system, we, we have structured flows of information that don't always work because people aren't really prepared for them. They, they don't really know what they're supposed to get out of it. So what I can do is, um, is keep working on articles, but also um, I can reach out to, to people and get, get people fed up with the paradigms that they need to make sense of what they're experiencing, uh, what, what they're being given or being, um, what, what's being presented to them. Should I go? Um, so I teach, or I'm going to be teaching um, in the fall, the introductory engineering courses, two, two sections of them at Virginia Tech. And uh, my strategy is to be humble. I think that's like the core idea of that. And I'm learning, like trying to prepare myself, for instance, with uh, um, really good information about how to, like there's a document that went out, it was by the University of Missouri about how to teach and be a leader during a racial crisis. That's a document on my list to read. And another is like, there's a workshop um, given by the American Society of Engineering Education about like integrating social justice into an engineering classroom. I, uh, I already know some things about that, but the humility part is where I just say, I don't know, maybe I have something to learn from this. So, and finally, ultimately, I think I'll try to learn from my students themselves and that gets into the whole co-design co of classrooms thing. So I'm trying to 
turn what we're talking about into actionable things for the classrooms that I'll be responsible for. Um, and as far as uh, interactions like with the group, um, I just feel like we should move beyond saying what we know, because I think we all know different things. Um, and a collaboration is more than saying what we know. So, and that's also the humility part. I'm definitely open to learning more. So, <clears throat> um, what could I do this week? I think uh, what I keep, what I always do, which is on at least a weekly basis, I have some sort of an opportunity to drop a little golden nugget of information to someone that I would hope gets them thinking just about the the idea that systems can change and reform and that what we had doesn't have to be what we will have. Um, considering everything that's going on right now, I think uh, everyone is primed to consider that things can be different. And um, when I hear anyone say, we need to get people back into the classroom so they can keep learning, I, I keep thinking, I think you're trying to get people back in the classroom so you can go back to work. I think it's like, the most important thing that's on everybody's mind. And it's like, why, what, why get people actually back into the classroom? And contextually that comes about in different ways for different people. So, um, yeah, just, uh, just dropping that little, that little witty remark here and there to get people thinking about the idea that things can be different is what I do. And then also just pointing out that uh, there are mediums for discussing these kind of things, such as this action circle. And that uh, when I, when I, especially when people get really upset on Facebook or something like that, and I like to say there are better, there are discussion groups for these sorts of things and ways that you can participate and get your opinion out that are a little bit more helpful. And constructive. I have plenty of people I can invite. I'd fill this place up. Um, so our summer semester just ended the other day. Um, so I will immediately be more compassionate as I'm grading all of their final assignments and putting in their final grades. Um, but also, you know, ever since we had to switch, cause I'm a college professor, um, ever since we had to switch from land-based to uh, remote teaching and the summer was all online, um, going into the fall, I am taking with me uh, you know, being more patient, more humble, as Christopher said, um, being more empathetic because I know that all of my students, um, you know, they range in age. I've got undergrads through grad students and grad students who aren't as familiar with the technology and this, the platforms that we use and whatnot, um, just giving them more grace and understanding that we're all in limbo right now and trying to just make our way through each day. Um, and in the future, I actually, I was trying to get my sister to uh, join us today, but you know, cause she's actually, she is a teacher. Um, she's a fourth, uh, yeah, fourth grade teacher. But um, I've been spreading the word to some of my other BCBA friends. And so hopefully in the coming weeks, I'll be getting them to join us.
Seven up. Heads up, seven up. <laughs> seven up. All right. Well, I was sitting here how, thinking how uh, I'm contributing as I'm waning out. <laughs> And that's to get the history out that uh, I keep sitting in my computer and that I don't have sent out to different folks. So I guess I should stop procrastinating and do more of that. Um, I, I, uh, I do talk to neighbors. My environment is sort of closed now. So as we walk around and I try to encourage different neighbors who are thinking of teaching, um, try and get them towards even thinking of precision teaching. But uh, at this point in time, uh, I haven't been too successful <laughs> at, at spreading the word and encouraging others to uh, investigate groups such as this. Um, but um, it's try, try again. Eight's up, nine's up. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I will continue to let people know that another way of talking is possible than the one that we are all used to. And that once we engage in that way of talking, the way of talking which I call sound verbal behavior, which is based on the fact that we create a contingency which is free of aversive stimuli, and we maintain that contingency by listening to ourselves while we speak. Because we monitor, we attend to the sound of our voice while we speak. That creates a different interaction. And it is this different interaction which is going to bring about the change that we need. And so I want to let people know that uh, uh, we are this period that we are going through with the COVID-19 epidemic, it, it kind of throws us back on ourselves, but at the same time, it also emphasizes the importance of human relationship. And in as much as we are struggling or troubled, um, uh, something good can actually come out of this, that we are able to bring more attention to what is really important in terms of how we interact with each other. And so I let all my students know, I teach a class in the summer, the summer course is coming to an end next week. And then in the fall, I teach three classes, uh, one principles of psychology and one in a social cultural context of person, of a social cultural uh, context of psychological development. Um, in these classes, which is all mainstream psychology, I, I very much make an emphasis on letting people know the behavioral uh, account, so to speak. Uh, I sort of just put everything in sort of like a behavioral perspective and let people know that, yeah, we all have our histories, of course, due to which we are the way we are, but we are able to learn and uh, learning is, uh, is, uh, occurs over the course of life. And so um, we are uh, getting better and I have really good hope based on my personal experience as an instructor, but also on all the conversations that I'm having every day with people on Skype or on Facebook, um, that this new way of talking, which will be so uh, important in uh, moving forward uh, is possible for everybody. And it only requires a little bit of, uh, yeah, you could say exploration so that we can become familiar with this and begin to recognize like, wow, we're so often in this way of talking, which is just not getting us anywhere. And we need to inhibit that way of talking to be able to have what I call sound verbal behavior. And we can actually inhibit that old conditioning and then be free to have a different kind of conversation. And um, of course, this is uh, touching upon education, it touches on relationship, but it also touches on how we organize our society in a political sense. And um, yeah, there's a lot of different angles to this, 
but I let everybody know that all these things are in the works and we are uh, moving forward and those people that are participating they will feel and experience that there is a possibility there which we haven't capitalized on yet so thank you hi <laughs> Um, one thing that I, well, I'm finished up this, I'm in school now, I'm, and next, next week is one more week of content, and next week is, following week, following week is final week, so, uh, I am, um, trying to be patient with myself in the process, and it's been a long road, and one thing I want to, people who also, who's in a practicing course, and also their, Right now, some of them are not working, so I'll continue to encourage those individuals and send them little messages uh, and remind them that, that you know it's so temporary and we and we'll get through this. It's okay and and it's and you just um, uh, live by grace and then and mind yourself why you're here and why you want to do this and and I had to myself the same thing too because sometimes we get, you tend to get catch up get caught up in the circus of this uh, of the current um uh the current st status of this uh world and also with our own individual lives and 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 um try to make sense of things and so i just want to bring that into the fall semester and um in terms of uh i think another question was asked i um, try to share. Um, uh, yeah, this is my first time ever, you know, interacting with people outside of my classroom about, you know, about applications of ABA and also just, so I'm just growing and learning and see where that will just continue to take me and I'm enjoying the process and I, and again, thank you for the invitation. Be safe. Mommy. Um. <clears throat> uh. So just to be clear, the question was, um. Uh. What can I do right now, or in the near future, uh, to help improve the education system? Right. Uh. Let's see. I just want to make sure of that because I want to make sure I remember that correctly. <laughs> um. So things I can do in the here and now or in the near future. Um, I guess help Alex with some of the stuff he's working on. I I've been helping to proofread some of his articles. Um, other than that, I mean I could. I mean, what something I'm thinking of doing is getting a teaching certificate soon. If once I'm once I've finished moving, um, and then uh. There's probably a bunch of other stuff, but I'm, for some reason I'm having trouble thinking of it off the top of my head. So <laughs> come back to me or don't. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you, Harry. Everybody needs a good editor. So you are contributing in a way that is really important. <laughs> um, okay. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming um, today and sharing your perspectives and your thoughts regarding these questions. Um, I've got a lot of, I've got a lot of an inspiration from what you all have shared to carry me through my week and I hope you all feel the same way. So today our, our conversation focused on what we could do to transform education. And our goal here is to bring together the right people into the circle so we can find a path um, towards, um, towards, you know, and a bigger scale towards world peace. If you, you know, have followed my writings and the work that, um, the work that I'm trying to do and the way that I'm trying to work, inspire the world. Um, but our first step is education. We need to kind of think, rethink. And I think, you know, COVID and what we're, you know, what we're experiencing as a, as a, um, global community gives us an opportunity to really rethink how we're going to, um, you know, take the next step. 
and integrate, you know, integrate the science of behavior and learning truly and without remorse <laughs> into our system to truly affect change. Um, you know, our, our perspectives here are very different. We come from very, you know, we have a member of our circle who is just in her initial training as a behaviorist. And we have, um, I hope this word is, comes off how, but an elder in our field, a person who has been doing this work um, on which I, you know, we are all um, here because we're standing on the shoulders of giants, the people who have done the work, they've done the research, they've done the work, and now we can take the lessons that have been learned and craft them into something that honors the work that has been done um, and builds upon it to kind of create, create the future that has been envisioned by um, those who have come before. So um, I appreciate you all being here. So I hope you will join us again next weekend. Next weekend, we're moving into our third gathering of this um, cycle. Um, there are four gatherings in every cycle. Uh, the, third the third gathering is focused on what will we do? So this is all about, we kind of, you know, we introduced it, we're, why are we here? What could we do? We're brainstorming, we're envisioning. And next week is you know, that clarification and finalization of like, what are those things, specific actions that we will take? And again, this isn't about, this isn't about, you know, false thinking that we're going to transform education in one meeting, but it is about what is the vision and what are the steps that we can take to get there? Because if we don't have a vision and we don't have a path forward, we'll absolutely never get to the end goal. So thank you for being here and um, honoring us with your presence and your contributions. And I hope to see you all next weekend. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye. Nice to meet you all. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. This Thanks was a great for coming, everyone. Thank you. Have a good weekend.